Does this make me look fat? Be honest. Just kidding. All right, we are back with another q and I just finished, I guess it was 33, and now we're on to 34. And I know there's people out there that are gonna be complaining. They're gonna be like, Milner, quit doing the Q&As. I will. This is gonna be the last one for a while. But uh, bear with me. I've gotta crank through some things here. And here we are, again, not in my primary location, in my secondary location. Question number one, and before I say this, let me precede this by saying, as I always do, one person with one opinion, take it for what it's worth, pick and choose the alternative facts that you want. Question number one, I am aiming to establish myself in a local art scene and I'm wondering what I should say or not say to someone who is established in the art world. Like how not to say you are a landscape photographer, which this person is getting from something I said before, but that might have been taken slightly out of context. The first thing you have to do is define what do you mean by art world? Because I would say, in my opinion, there are multiple flavors of the art world. You have what I would call a local art world scene, which is in some, some ways a little bit like public access television. Where, and I would classify this as more the lower end art scene. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I just mean to say that this is not the Museum of Modern Art art world. This is your local coffee shop art world. And each of these art worlds serves a purpose and a place and also serves a specific timeline in the career of an artist. It's not often as an artist you go from you know, Billy out in the middle of nowhere in the sticks to the Museum of Modern Art. You have to work your way up. So define what art world you're talking about. The people on the lower end of the art world are gonna be far more approachable than the folks on the top. Trying to get to a curator at a museum or a national gallery or even a high-end photo gallery in a town can be very, very difficult. People are incredibly elusive these days even though we have 900 forms of communication. Sorry, my pillow's slipping. 900 forms of communication and yet no one responds to anything and the higher you go up the food chain the harder people are to engage with typically occasionally you will meet a curator or gallerist or someone that's so nice and so approachable and those people are pure gold and make sure you nurture that relationship because those in my experience are few and far between so and the same thing about saying a if you're a landscape photographer you have to own the fact that you're a landscape photographer and it's not to say that landscape photography is not being utilized in the art world. It is, but there's typically a concept behind it. It's not just straight, you know, Rocky Mountain landscape. It's not the Grand Teton in the morning where there's 35 photographers lined up in a row all shooting the exact same photo. I actually have a picture of 35 photographers in a row lined up shooting the Tetons at sunrise. That's not gonna make it in an art gallery because no one cares. It's too ubiquitous, it's too common. Good good landscape photography. I would the, the person that I would throw in from the photography world that you should look at is Edward Bertinsky, who is not technically, in my opinion, a landscape photographer, but a lot of his work is sort of landscape photography. There's also a great, um, documentary about him called, if I'm if I'm not if I'm remembering this correctly, manufactured landscapes. Start with Bertinsky. He's a superstar. He's actually a cool guy too. I've met him a couple of times. Got to hang out with him once in his studio in Toronto, and I was like, man, I wish I was closer because I would really hang out with him. And he's very smart a very good photographer and a very good business person and someone that me personally, I'd look at and say, man, I could learn a ton from that guy. And that's a great place to start. Question number two, get my notes here, people. In your opinion, what will the role of online community be in photography going forward? I'm concerned that younger people are focused on photographers who are more active online instead of photographers who have taken the time to actually create a body of work that says something. I don't want, and I put this a giant X with quotes, I don't want X type of photographer to overlook the, the likes of ML, ML Duck, who's the Duke, the kid I talked about a few weeks ago, Carol and Drake example. These are Duke and Drake are like high-end photojournalists. ML Duke is in, uh, is in Ukraine right now. I saw an image either New York Times or Washington Post earlier where he's there. I think he's on assignment for the New York Times. And the ex-photographer that this person who wrote the question is referring to is a, I guess you would call him a film darling on YouTube, who's not really a professional photographer, but he's a really good YouTuber and 
shoots film and has zillions of followers and everything, but I don't want to throw him under the bus and, and use his name. There's a bunch of these folks out there. And yes, that's an online photographer and you're talking about you know, actual industry people and these other folks. The online people are always going to overshine the industry people in the online world. In the industry world, the world of the New York Times, the world of agency photography, of editorial photography, of his historical photography, news gathering, spot news, historical events, the, they're gonna overshadow the online world because who cares about the online world? Again, these are two separate worlds. You can't worry what anybody else is doing. You have to do what you do and do that as best as you possibly can. And in terms of what the future of the online community is gonna be, it's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and become more and more important, which is why I think it's critical that you take a stand about who you wanna be online and what you wanna do online. Do you wanna, do you want to engage with companies who practice absolutely incredibly unethical behavior on a daily basis? Or do you wanna build your own platform and work by your own uh, algorithm and build your own ecosystem so that if and when the leadership of these companies decides to change things like their algorithm, your life is not yo-yoed because they're, they're doing this to you. So again, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the idea between a short form, a short play and a long play. Short play is figure out whatever, whatever platform is super hot right now and throw all your effort into it. Long play is, eh, I'm gonna slow down. I'm gonna build my audience one person at a time and I'm gonna build it on a system that makes me feel good as a human being and makes me feel healthy and makes me want to actually continue to do this. The last q and I talked about pressure. People assume that you know I have pressure to post things. I don't and I will never let myself get to that point because then I'm typically not me anymore. And so again, that's, that's the, uh, the role of the online community. Don't run away from any of this. Study it, figure out what works for you, and then engage in that way. Question number three. Oh, this is a good one. Someone asked me for editing help. And actually, a whole bunch of people in a 24-hour uh, period reached out to me and said, hey, can you help me find an editor? And some of the people who were reaching out to me were professional photographers who had a body of work or who'd been working in, on something and they couldn't quite nail their theme or their they needed some editing help which we all do from time to time and i was like yeah i can help with that and so i reached out to five editors that i knew two had quit two were only editing a specific kind of work and didn't want to do anything else and one had started kind of their own editing thing and didn't want to edit for anyone else so I was like, man, and I, the there were five gone right there. And I was like, wow, another person I reached out to who's in New York, he was all over it and said, yep, just connect me with your friends and I'll help you out. And he's a full-time professional editor, great. Someone else asked for editing help in LA. And I was like, oh, there's gotta be tons of people in LA, tons of legitimate like high-end photo editors in LA. Everyone I reached out to said the same thing. Oh, there's tons, you know, I've got tons of names. I said, fine, give me one. No one could give me a name. That, I reached out to five different professional photographers or organizers in the city. No one could give me a name of an editor. And some of the people just stopped responding after they said, oh, there's tons of them. And I said, well, just give me one name. They haven't responded and probably never will. And then one person responded and said, yes, there's tons of them, and then gave me names of people in New York. So this tells me something, which I already knew, but it reinforces this point, is this is a major problem that the likes of the best, some of the best editors in the world. And when I came up in photography, I was fortunate because the, there were tons of these people around. And in fact, oftentimes you were working with them on a daily basis. Nowadays, that's a part of the equation that's been tossed aside. And a lot of these people were fired, they were laid off, or they aged out and retired, and they were not replaced by anyone else. And so I was really staggered by this, even though I kind of figured that was what was gonna happen. I was amazed at how hard it was to find anyone who was editing. And the subsets of people that were like, I will only edit for this, but I can't do this. I don't want to do this. And I'm like, uh-uh, that's a big turnoff. I don't want to connect you with a friend of mine who just wants someone to help them edit a body of work. I don't want all this other baggage involved. So I was, it, it's hard. For one fleeting second, I thought, man, why don't I do it? Like, I'm not the worst editor in the world, which is definitely the best promo I could ever give. Hey, hire me, I'm not the worst. That sounds pretty good, right? I would hire me if I had that catchphrase. 
And I was like, okay, I'm not the worst editor in the world. I actually think I'm a pretty decent editor. Uh, and I'm kind of merciless, uh, which I think you have to be when you're, when you're editing. In fact, when I went in the other night to teach at a graduate class, which I mentioned in another film, I think, uh, went in, gave a talk, first in-person talk in two years, and I go in there, and, and there's work on the wall, and they're in the middle of a critique. And I, man, I look at this body of work. There's probably 12 prints on the wall. And I was like, bam, four were just immediately. It was like the beautiful mind thing with Russell Crowe. The code just emerged from the wall. And I was like, those four, those four. Now, and this is a very important point. This was a studio arts photographer who was going to work in academia and the art world, not someone with a background like mine. So I was looking at the work through the filter of my background, which was not applicable to their background. So my input on their work was coming from a tangential direction that may or may not apply to them. But I had to say, look, from my perspective in this area that I'm coming from, those four picks, that's all I need. That's a great promotional piece. But this person probably doesn't need a promotional piece because that's not, that's not how it works in that space. So all those little subsets and some layers are fascinating and things that you have to learn. Question number four. I'm just gonna go ahead and renumber these now so that I'm not cursing myself later, which I normally do. All day long, I'm like, damn it, Dan. Get a hold of yourself, man. Okay, I think this is from Kurt. I've heard you talk about what it means to be a professional photographer, doing taxes, having a lawyer, having insurance. Do you still need those things if, you are a, non if a non-professional wants to go do a story? The short answer is no. If you are shooting for yourself, you don't need all of that stuff. Yes, you're gonna have to pay taxes wherever you are in the world, and that sucks, we all know that, but you don't need all of these things. You don't need an agent, you don't need a tax protocol for your photography, you just go, just go do stories. And in a lot of ways, that's the best place to be. When I gave the talk the other night, I get up in front of the audience for, at the very beginning of the talk, and my computer's on the other side of the room, which is kind of atypical. So I've gotta get up and do a little talking, then I would walk to the back, change the slides, and kind of go back and forth. It also keeps people a little bit more alert when you're in there moving around, and they're like, what the heck is that guy doing? Duck and weave, man. Jim Carrey. So I said to them, who are you? What are you doing here? And I said something about professional, and the first student said, I have no intention of ever doing anything professional. And I was like, great, that's amazing that you know that now. And that provides a certain kind of freedom that I don't think you're gonna get when you are a professional. Because when you're a professional and the work is going out in professional spaces and you're getting model releases and location releases and, and architectural releases, and you've got taxes that, you know, <clears throat> you're buying equipment out of state, and if you're living in California and buying in New York and using that equipment <clears throat> in California, you're gonna have to pay sales tax on it, all these different things. The IRS is <clears throat> changing the rules all the time. It can be incredibly confusing. I had a lawyer, I had an attorney, I had a tax protocol, I was paying quarterly, I had a payroll service, I had all that stuff. It's a total nightmare and something I am very glad that I'm away from. Now, you're gonna have a whole subset of photographer who tries to cut corners and they're gonna not do any of that. They're not gonna do a business license. They're not gonna file a fictitious business name. They're not gonna do anything on the up and up because they're trying to fly under the radar. The same thing is applying now on YouTube with zillions of people with drones and many of them don't have the 117 which I think is the forum I'm talking about. It's the test you have to take to be a drone operator. I just saw that from outer space and said, I am not doing that. I do not want to be involved with the government here in any way, shape or form. And I can see that only getting worse because in my opinion, the FAA dropped the ball. They didn't see the, the consumer drone market coming and they were flat footed. It took them a couple years to catch up. And then they were like, oh, we're gonna go out and penalize people and start retroactively fining you for flying a drone. I was like, I'm just gonna give my drone away. I don't need it. You don't need any of that stuff if you're a consumer. Just go have fun, enjoy it, talk to people, do the best work you can, try to learn on every project, do things that kind of terrify you creatively, make sure that you're failing on a regular basis. If you're, if you're churning out the same Instagram crap content that everybody else is, what's the point? Okay, there was a little tough love. Oh, little tough love. This is a good question. Someone actually asked me about a photographer. Mmm, think about that. You remind me of Tyler Durden from Fight Club. That's a great movie, man. That is a great movie. First rule of Fight Club, watch Dan's YouTube channel. How do you feel about Salgado's work on the Sahel? 
the end of the road. So if I remember correctly, Sebastio Salgado, by the way, is the photographer we're talking about. If you don't know who Sebastio Salgado is, you probably are missing out on the single most important documentary photographer of the modern era. I'm not sure there's anyone remotely in his category for the kind of work that he does, the books he produces, the shows he produces, the impact he makes. He's a household name. Uh, my mom knew Sebastio Salgado, believe it or not. I was kind of surprised. And so Salgado, the Sahel was, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, someone correct me, the Sahel was really the first project that put Salgado on the map. And this was 83, 84, if I remember correctly, uh, famine. And Salgado has a background in finance, and he was working for an international coffee company and was in the field and realized that he wanted to do photography more than economics and became a photographer went to the Sahel on his own money with bulk rollers, and that's a little plastic machine with a, with a crank and dials. They're very cool. It's like 1960s Maxwell Smart kind of stuff. And you bulk roll a 100-foot roll of film into 36 exposure rolls, and you do it manually with canisters that may or may not have light leaks and canisters that if you drop may or may not explode on the pavement and have your film shoot all over the place, but it's dirt cheap. And Salgado did that, and he went and dove into that project and started to make the images that made him the person he is today. And that book is terrifying and horrifying and horrible and incredibly important. So I think there is nothing negative I have to say about Sebastian Salgado. I don't know him as a human being. I've been to a bunch of lectures that he's done, and I've, he's been, I've been a huge fan of his work since I got into photography. Pretty much everybody I know looks at Salgado and just goes, I'm going to tip my hat because he's working in a way that kind of is unique to the actual industry of photography. And um, he's somebody to study and model. And also remember that Salgado, I, I look at Salgado as a team. He's making the images. His wife is an integral part of what he does. And he's also probably got printers and he's got studio people. And it's a, it's a, I don't know what you call it. It's an ecosystem, for lack of a better word. So yes, I am five star for anything Salgado. Uh, number six, someone reached out about doing a long-term project about bike messengers, and they were asking about how to find what's been done, and then how also to find really good high-level photography. And I mentioned this in the last Q&A, but um, when it comes to bike messengers in particular, I think that is a subculture within a subculture. So the sub original subculture would be cycling, and then the sub second subculture would be bike messengers who use the bicycle to do their job. And that is a very, very territorial, unique subculture within cycling. They tend to be eccentric. They tend to have big personalities. They are amazing athletes. They do crazy stuff in traffic that I would die five minutes after trying. And so... I don't know how receptive they are to being photographed. I don't imagine it would be that difficult. I can't imagine bike messengers saying, no, I don't really want to be photographed. You're probably going to run into that from time to time. But it's also, my thought was, how interesting would it be to compare bike messengers to, to everyday Joes that also ride bikes? You know, it's, it's the older couple you see riding at night. It's the little kid on his first bike with tricycles and maybe doing a, a, a compare and contrast portrait series and start there. I would Google, obviously, to see what's been done on bike messengers, and then I would meet bike messengers, and I would, I would imagine that in every major city in the world, you are gonna have, within that subculture, you are gonna have the superstars in the, in the bike messenger world. These are the people that everyone else reveres. Track one of these people down and tell them what you're trying to do, and get their, get their take on what it is, and what it would feel like, and what it would mean, and, and, and why what they're doing is so interesting, what's changing in the industry. I'm sure that when email replaced the fax, uh, and replaced a lot of in-person things, that they're, they're, the impact was felt in their community. That's what I would do. And in terms of high-level photography, agencies, galleries, museums, uh, and then also professional organizations, ASMP, APA, those are kind of things where you're going to get into that. And also study the roster at things like the Palm Springs Photo Festival. If you go to the faculty page on Palm Springs Photo Festival, that'll keep you busy for the next five years because there's no fat on that page. Those are all absolutely active working. The founder of the festival, Jeff Dunis, did you a huge favor by starting this festival in the first place, which you have to be a little bit mentally off to want to do this, and hopefully he is, it's not easy. And just, just, just to juggle the people who are on the faculty is not easy. But look at who's on there. You've got 
Art buyers, art directors, agents, editors, photographers, collectors, gallerists, curators, everybody's on that list. Those are the legit folks in the industry. Just start there. Numero siete. I'm a little late to the story, but I recently saw that Kodak deleted an Instagram post featuring photos by Jack Wack from Xinjiang region of China and probably a top five most important stories of the decade. Yes, what's happening to the Uyghur population, the Muslim minority Uyghur population in China is a bad situation. In an apology to China, that content was not authorized by Kodak and their Instagram page is not intended for a platform to be a political commentary. Afterwards, I went out and purchased Jack's book, Dust. Now I've heard about that book. I've not seen it. I've heard it's really good. That is a tragic story and that is an understatement of epic proportion. What's happening to the Uyghurs is really bad. The first project I saw on the Uyghurs was by David Buto, who is a, um, a photojournalist that's based, I wanna say out of DC right now. It could be back in LA. I have no idea where he is actually. Um, David's a really good guy, really good photographer. He's been good for a long time. He did a project on the Uyghurs back in the 90s. That was the first time I saw that story. So uh, I'm sure that this Jack guy probably knows that that Buto story has been done and he's probably extrapolating and working on it in the modern sense. The fact that, and I think what you said in this question, and I don't know this for sure, is that this ran on the Kodak Instagram page and then they made an apology to China. That is no surprise. Kodak is in, they're trying to make money. Kodak is in business. Kodak is a classic, historic, conservative company. Wildly conservative. I worked for them for four years, Kodak Professional. Did I tell you that I had to wear a chartreuse golf shirt? I did. I had a closet filled with shirts that were the most inhumane, unnatural colors you have ever seen. There was like, the only place you're ever going to see those same cover colors is if you open a Bass Fisherman's Tackle Box and you see the lures, the color of the lures that he or she is using, those are the only two places on earth those colors exist. They were nauseating. And by the way, they were always four sizes too, too, too big. They were circus tents. I wear a medium, right? I'm skinny, so, yo soy flaco, I'm very skinny. And I would get these Kodak shirts and the shoulders would go down to here and you know, the logo, they were enormous. And I remember once when my boss, who sadly is no longer with us, uh, rest in peace, my friend, he was a great guy. He was like, I can't do this anymore, man. I can't wear these, these yellow shirts. I can't do chartreuse. And he's like, I'm, gonna, I'm wearing a black shirt, man. I'm wearing a black shirt to the trade show. And then he got us all black shirts to wear to a trade show. And it was like, dun, 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 dun. Like management was probably like, Stat, DEFCON 1, we got black shirts in the booth. They didn't know what to do. But I think that was what pushed Kodak a little bit into the modern era. So the fact that they would apologize to China is no shock to me. Um, they don't want to rock the boat. China is a superpower and they do not mess around. And they do not like anyone talking about what's happening to the Uyghurs. No one wants to talk about that. There is no political leader on earth that's out there saying, you know what, I'm going to get involved and like, try to save the Uyghur people. That's not the culture we live in anymore. Just getting people, I mean, getting Americans to realize the impact of what's happening in the Ukraine, just getting that to happen, which is a full-scale invasion, assault, helicopters, missiles, shelling civilian areas, that's having a hard time making an impact. This sort of long-term repressive, under-the-radar uh, elimination of a, of, a sub, of a Muslim subculture, that's really hard to get people's attention. And I am not joking about that in any way, shape, or form. That is a horrible situation. And I have seen satellite feeds, I've seen satellite images, I've seen really disturbing stuff. And so I don't know personally what that solution is. You gotta tip your hat to people out there who are photographing this and trying to put this story in the headlines. That is a thankless job and a dangerous job. So well done. Um, and I'm probably getting his name wrong, but look for the book dust. Okay, number eight. What's my coffee recipe? Espresso coffee. And when I say this, for the love of God, pay attention because I am not messing around in this regard. This is serious. This is the first thing I'm doing every morning. So it, I might want to have a plan in place. When I say espresso coffee, I don't mean fake espresso coffee. I don't mean coffee from a coffee shop that has the word espresso on it, but you look at it and you go, that's just dark coffee that they sort of slapped an espresso label on. No, you have, and if I, if I use coffee like that, 
and I put it in my wife's coffee. In 30 seconds, she goes, this isn't real espresso. And I'm the same way. I can smell it, I can sniff it out, and I can taste it, and I can definitely feel the impact difference between real espresso and non, and just coffee that's masked as espresso. So start with the right stuff. Then I add, uh, I don't do a lot of lack, uh, regular dairy products. Um, I've, I've been allergic to it my whole life. And so I can do it and it's not the end of the world, but I try not to. And I definitely feel a difference, especially when I'm doing yoga and I'm running, if I'm having dairy stuff, I just don't feel well. I had a huge dinner last night and I've had a blazing headache all day because I ate too much and I ate too wide a range of stuff. My body does best with super simple stuff. So my, and my coffee is not super simple, but it's worth it, trust me. Real espresso, good milk, whatever you wanna use. I use, sometimes I'll use oat, sometimes I'll use soy, sometimes I'll use almond, depends. And occasionally I'll use regular, um, regular milk, cow milk. I love saying that, cow milk. It just, it really reduces it back to the fact that someone is going like this on a cow. Some kid on some farm is like, this sucks. I gotta get to the city. That kid is is basically supplying all of us. And that's a cool thing, man. Less than 2% of Americans are involved in farming and ranching, and that's a crime. Good milk, ghee, which is refined butter, which you can either make yourself or you can buy. It's expensive. It's like one of those products where you know that someone's out there like, I'm gonna charge just crazy prices and see what happens. So you add good espresso, good milk, good ghee, MCT oil, MCT oil, and then I add, this is a little New Mexico flair, red chili. And uh, man, you wanna, you wanna clear the baffles? <sighs> That'll do it. That will do it. That's my coffee recipe. Number nine, keywording from a stock perspective. Um, this is a person asking me about Peter Crow's book, the digital asset management book, which is about how do you manage digital assets? It is a fantastic book. Peter Crow is a very, very smart dude who knows exactly what he's doing. And he is so far beyond anywhere that I ever will be that I look at him in awe. And he also has great hair. If you've ever met Peter, you see him across the parking lot and you're like, ah, oh, what a jerk. Look at that hair. I'm trying to think of who else would have it. Maybe like Kurt Russell in the um, Tango and Cash movie. You know, you're like, man, that is a silky mane he's got. Peter's got great hair. He's a very smart dude. I don't utilize the exact platform that Peter uses in the book because I'm not that good. And also we have different needs. But here's the, here's the truth, the 100% reality of my scenario right now. I have no archiving plan right now. I'm in, the, uh, I'm in transition, if you will, because, and I've mentioned this before, and this rubs some people the wrong way, I've got at least 50 terabytes of data I'd like to archive. I don't know how to get that online easily. I've got ideas and I have solutions I can, but storing it is very expensive and also time consuming and I need it in multiple places. So I'm in the process of getting a new laptop from Blurb, I finally got approved. So that will come probably in September, my luck with Apple. They can't seem to supply much right now, which I totally get. New laptop, that will have immediately have a VPN, one password, and something else I can't remember. Uh, uh, oh, and like a Backblaze B2 backup. So I still don't know where I'm gonna put everything, especially the, the motion content I'm making is a nightmare. Oh my God, is it a nightmare? Where do you put all this stuff? And how do you access it? I've got 40 terabytes right back here in four 10 terabyte SATA drives. That's my secondary backup. When those drives fill up, I pull them out, I put four new ones in. So I've got 40 terabytes, then I'll have 80 terabytes. I'm in and out of those drives all the time. Plus I have all my portable drives that I'm taking into the field. But where I'm gonna store this video footage, your guess is as good as mine. I really think at this point, even though it's not a long-term solution, portable hard drives in redundancy is one thing, but also Backblaze is great for your primary system, but I can't plug in my entire set of drives into that and think they're gonna back it up at some affordable price, unless I'm missing something. So what the hell was the question? Uh, uh, oh, keywording. Keywording is about retrieval speed in sales. So if you, it doesn't matter how many images you make, if you can't retrieve them and find them, whether you're making a blur book and you, you need something quick, you need a portfolio for a client, you need a portfolio for a job, even if you want to recap a story you've done, you've got to be able to find that stuff. 
People ask me how I can make so many books. My response is I have a system. I have a system for where my images come in, where they are, how they're labeled, how they're prepped, and where the, if they're ready for publication. Keywording for your stock is very important. If when I, Let's say that I'm in Albania in May and I get, in, uh, I get a request for an image I shot in 1990 in Austin. I can just go to my Lightroom catalog and just say Austin 1990 and I'm gonna get everything I shot. That is really important if that's the kind of thing you're doing. If you are a birding photographer, an amateur birding photographer, and that's all you do, you could keyword based on species or you know subspecies or however birders categorize birds. I have no idea. Red, blue, hey look at that blue bird. And there's 700 kinds of blue bird and people like me are like, I don't know. The damn thing looks blue. So you could do that, but if you're not having image requests and you're not making books, and you're not doing all that, then you can sort of pull back a little bit and just put maybe location and state or time or whatever you want to do. I guess I should end that point by saying I'm not the person to ask. I'm a train wreck, but thank you for having confidence in me because no one else does. Question number 10, I knew this would happen. I said, I, I told you about a bag uh, in my last, oh, what's going on here? I told you about a bag, a new bag I got in the last film and, and someone was like, what's that bag, man? Tell me the details. And I will, just because I'm very kind. This is a bag made by a company called Mystery Ranch. This is called a Ruck 15. Now, it has this patch thing on the front, which I had not seen before. That's on there. Now, I saw that and I was like, man, I have patches for AG23. That's kind of a cool subliminal way of marking. I can just wear it around when I'm in airports and stuff because people are gonna go, what is that? And I'm gonna say, oh, that's great. Thanks for asking, here's a copy. And uh, you know, we're here to promote understanding through dialogue and art and you should look at these contributors and the work they've done and that kind of thing. So that was kind of cool. The problem is I have, I use Tenba bags, I use um, Shimoda bags and I use um, Atlas packs right? Those are my primary camera systems. All my Fuji stuff's in the Tenba stuff. My Sony stuff is in the Shimoda stuff. All my outdoor, my sort of adventure photography stuff is in the Atlas stuff. And I use all of those bags all the time when I go out in the van. They're all in there. And then depending on what the mission is for that day, I pick and choose. The problem is the smallest one is 30 liters. And I'm walking around town and I'm running errands and I've got this 30 liter backpack on and I'm also in and off of my folding bike and I'm like, man, this thing is big. And so they don't make a smaller bag. So I'm looking around for a smaller bag. I don't, I'd never even heard of Mystery Ranch, which is on me. I'm sure they're, I think they're a massive bag company. And I'm like, hey, a 15. And I read very quickly what it's supposed to hold. And in my head, I'm like, that's impossible. But I bought it anyway, right? So I get this thing and I love it for a couple of reasons. One, these little zippers up the side here do this, which you don't even need to use. You can just actually pull from this tab right here to open it, but this tab is, is magnetized. So it stays shut even if you're not, if the zippers are open, which is super cool, especially for safety reasons of just flipping it around. And um, inside this bag, I kid you not, it's a 15 bag. I have a Fuji camera with a lens. I have my audio kit. I have the little tripod slash selfie horrifying, I'm embarrassed to say that, thing for the iPhone that I use all the time. I have my glasses, my wallet, my space pen, which I'm gonna get to in a minute, my water bottle, and then, and my journal, which is a, an eight and a half by 11 uh, book right now, so it's rather sizable. Then it says that this will hold an iPad and a, and a 15 inch laptop. And this is a tiny bag. And I'm thinking there is no way that that stuff's gonna fit in there. I'm not even gonna try. And then five minutes later, I was like, okay, I'm gonna try. I put it in there and it fit. And the laptop sleeve is in the back and it has this lip that comes over in Velcro. So it's super secure, but you look at it and you think there's no way that's gonna fit. Now I have a 14 inch laptop, I think, or a 13. And it just went zip and slipped in. So the other night when I went to teach and I left the house, I had this bag only, and I had every single thing that I needed to go down there and teach. I had the power cord, the charger on the Apple, on my laptop, which is approximately this big and weighs approximately 84 pounds. I had that, I had the camera, I had everything I needed that I was doing that. So it works incredibly well. It was not super expensive, and that's the bag that I'm using now for, the, for this today, right now at 2.08 p.m. on the 24th of 
February, that is the bag that I'm using. But I am not loyal, my friend. I told you those three other bags that I use all the time, I am loyal. I love those companies. I love the people behind them. Number 11, this won't focus, I don't think, but the space pen. I mentioned this and someone was like, space pen, space pen, space pen, tell me, gotta have it. And you do have to have it. Now I'm not excited by ballpoints. I'm historically not excited by ballpoint pens. I never have been. I'm not Jerry uh, Seinfeld. But this one I have to say, this is called a space pen made by a company called Fisher. They've been around forever. The thing is tiny, right? It fits in that part of my hand. It is very, very small and light. I bought the black one with a clip. The clip for me is key because then it clips into the bag and it's not gonna come flying out when I open the bag. This came with a medium black point. I'm not a medium guy. I started writing with it and I was like, I don't really like this pen. So just the last second, I was like, I'm gonna order a fine point. I ordered blue because I prefer to write in blue and I also ordered green because it matches my bag and that's really the most important thing, obviously. And that was it. Fine point, blue ink, this pen, fantastic. And the thing, the trick for me is this, it's not gonna blow up on the airplane. And the space pen from Fisher has been around forever. It's a pen that like writes underwater, it writes in space, it's pressurized, it's got nitrogen in there that's pressurizing the ink. It's very basic, it's very strong and it's very dependable. I write a ton all day long, and legibility is historically a major problem for me. My writing is so bad. I have had people in cafes ask me what language I'm writing in, and when I say English, they go, no, that's impossible, let me see it. And they're wanting to look at my journal, and I have to say, no, it's my journal, get away. You're creepy, and stop touching my leg. This pen allows me to write legibly for whatever reason. And I think it's because the ballpoint is really slow in comparison to some of the other tools that I use. I love the mechanical pencil, as I mentioned before, but when you are pasting things into a journal, Polaroids, Instax, um, printed copy of copies that I've done on the uh, uh, writing I've done on the computer that I print out and paste into the journal, the mechanical pencil point is so fine, it punches through the paper over and over again especially if there's a lip up to a Polaroid, it will punch through and you can't write, whereas the ballpoint pen just goes right over it. So it's been a nice little transition for me. I really like this pen, and no, I'm not sponsored by them. Okay, last question. Good, perfect timing, 38. Why blog if I have a YouTube channel? Great question. I love blogging. Blogging is slow and quiet. Blogging is like walking through a meadow in the snowstorm. It really is. Blogging to me is about still photographs and copy. That's it. And it's a very, very different style of content that I'm making on YouTube. And it is, it is a relaxing, fun thing that has been a daily part of my life since 2002. I started blogging in 2002. Think about that. You were, Los Angeles was all dirt roads in 2002. It was all orange groves and we, and everyone spoke Spanish in 2002. I love doing it. It's great. I just loaded up four images from last weekend on my site. Thank you, Charlene and Fleming. And I put the images on there and it's four pictures from the experience I had last weekend, two days out in the van. And now when I'm done with this film, I'm going to go and start writing the copy that will go with that. That is still my all time favorite content, my favorite style of work is stills and copy. That's it. That's why I blog. I also think that the community that surrounds the blog is very different than the community that surrounds the YouTube channel. And I am hoping to converge the two because I think there's a lot of people that would like to know one another in those two groups. Thank you for tuning in. I'm one person with one opinion and I'll just be sitting here with my space pen writing some magic and probably just wearing this around the house, you know, because how cool am I now with my water bottle that I found that, you know, I found on the road somewhere. And, uh, and that's it. So I appreciate it and I'll be back.